right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's live stream with Matt Petrick and Suriname Alcoholic Beverages. We have several special guests from the company joining us, as you can see on screen, Karen, Rika, Steven, welcome. Uh, I'm gonna let Matt introduce you guys in just a moment, but before we jump in, my name is Will Hookinga from Zabby.co and uh, see a few f familiar faces in the audience already today. Uh, thanks for saying hello, let it, letting us know where you're tuning in from. Um, feel free to do that on the chat box to the right. And uh, if you have any questions at any point uh, for any of our guests for Matt, uh, you'll see a little button at the bottom of the screen that says ask a question. So just click that button. You can enter your question in there. Matt will be monitoring those throughout the presentation and we'll be able to, uh, to ask them at the appropriate time. Um, and last but not least, feel free to share the event, invite, uh, invite your friends to join us. There's a button at the top right to do that. Um, but with that said, Matt, I will turn things over to you now. Thank you, Will. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, these uh, videos we're doing here uh, with Suriname Alcoholic Beverages uh, are a series that we have been doing with WERSPA, the West Indies Rum and Spirits Producers Association, uh, essentially a Caribbean-wide collection of countries that make rum. And since the pandemic started, we've been trying to take people behind the scenes of the distilleries because we can't travel there ourselves. So we've done an, a number of distilleries already from uh, Guyana, from Barbados, from uh, St. Lucia. Uh, today, I'm very excited that we're going to Suriname, uh, which is a country I admit I did not know as much about until a few days ago. Uh, but uh, I was very surprised to see some of the, some of the great rums in their, in their amazing looking distillery. So I'm excited that we're doing this. Um, let's first just sort of go through and have everybody from uh, SAB introduce themselves. Uh, let's start with Rika. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Rico Lilia Basari. I work for Sudan Alcoholic Beverages, and I've been working here about just 28 years. I'm responsible for the mixing and blending department, and I'm also the master blender of this company. Excellent. And Karen, tell us about yourself. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Karen Wong Fong Sang. I'm the acting supply chain manager and production manager. I've been working with SAB for two years now, going on my third year. And uh, like I said, I, I'm responsible for production and supply chain. Okay. And I'm Stephen Moore. I am the uh, current uh, CEO of the company. I am the second uh, generation of this company, and I have been in this job since uh, 2000. It's quite wow, time. 20 years. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you all. We've uh, prepared quite a presentation. Uh, I know Karen and I have gone back and forth, and I know Stephen added some content in there. So let's jump right in. Can I go? Yeah. yeah, can I go? Okay. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present ourselves to the world, to the room world. I think it is very useful because uh, Suriname is, uh, for a lot of the audience, I think, a very, very much unknown story. Uh, let alone talk about Suriname. They don't know what Suriname is, where it is. And uh, even in South America, when you travel, you can come around people and say, well, Suriname is in Africa somewhere. So, but Suriname has a very interesting story, and that I will try to explain in the in the in the presentation that we have is that we have been doing rum, and people ask you doing rum in Suriname. So basically, we are uh, a country on the northeast shoulder of South America, bordering with Guyana, France, Guyana, Brazil, and the Atlantic Ocean in the north. Uh, very uh, multicultural uh, country. We have one of the highest ethical diversity in the region. Um, we have a very harmonious uh, community also. Only 500,000 people live here. But uh, Suriname has an interesting thing also about it is that it was uh, traded many, many decades ago by uh, between the United Kingdom and uh, the Netherlands with New York. So that, uh, the, the, the Netherlands had owned Suriname. Oh, no, the Netherlands owned New York and the United Kingdom owned Suriname. And then they traded it and we became part of the Dutch uh it was in the colonial times so if that didn't happen then we would also be speaking english like the rest of the caribbean 
So uh, in many respects, we are a little, uh, how you say, we are a little different because uh, we are in South America, uh, we are not an island, but we still have a blend from both sides that makes us, I think in our opinion, quite unique. But we speak Dutch also, and the rest of the of the Caribbean, of the English-speaking Caribbean, they speak English, and then the rest of South America is uh, either Spanish or Portuguese. But uh, going back to Suriname, I think uh, a lot of people, uh, we had people here over the years, people coming on from Canada, etc not knowing where they were coming from, uh, where they were going to, and they were asking, what are we going to Suriname? We had some master blenders here, some excellent people coming in, and they were very reluctant to come here. So we had to convince them, come to Suriname, and at the end of the day, when they had to leave, they were like, uh, I want to come back, and I want to stay here for longer to work with you guys. So that was something that was for us a very nice experience. Um, we have in Suriname, we have been uh, doing sugar we had uh, over, in the 16th, 17th century, we had over 200 sugar estates. And the last remaining sugar estate is an interesting story also, what uh, the sugar estate Marienburg, you can see. And it was a uh, sugar estate uh, founded by Dutch German settlers. So we had a lot of German settlers here also. That's why the name Marienburg is also the name of one of our best brands, well, uh, Overproof Rum, is still, had, still existing now after so many decades. So uh, the history of Suriname goes back from the 60th century with the rum, etc. But this company, like you say, Suriname Alcohol, Bef Suriname Alcohol Beverages, was founded in 1966. But the, one of the founding uh, companies of this company, of Suriname of SEB, was the sugar estate Marienburg. And that was one of the shareholders. And that company was also owned by the uh, rubber massacre by Amsterdam. So there's a very strong link from uh, from the past with Holland, with the Dutch. Um, so this company was set up uh, on the on the Suriname River. Uh, you will see later in the presentation where it is located and where the sugar estate Marienburg was. Marienburg from a uh, Marienburg sugar estate was the last remaining of more than 200 sugar plantation that all disappeared uh, throughout the years, the dec decades rather. So that's unfortunately, and we are now looking towards a more brighter future because I think that uh, we have been doing uh, rum molasses in the past, and then we had a period that we didn't get really able to, to source our molasses. That's why that is something that will also come in the presentation. But I think uh, when I tell, tell this story to people, they will they will look in Suriname and New York. What a it's not a comparison. That is true in part, but. After we hit some big uh, oil and, and gas, I think that maybe the, the, the UK will say, hey, why? We didn't make such a good deal after all. But that is something that will come up in maybe five to seven years when we will, all these oil wells that we found offshore will go into production. So that yeah, is something. I, I know, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's happening in uh, Guyana as well, that they are also have sort of offshore yes. oil and gas, which is going to change their economy. True, they find well after a well, and it is like they have, I think, 18 now, and we have, I think, three now. But wow. their expectations that we will find much, much more, more than we can even handle, actually. Wow. So that's interesting, and uh, I think that uh, that is uh, going back to the old that we are able to to again start this industry in Suriname, going hand in hand with the development in the oil industry. We have a lot of gold also. So Suriname is quite uh, quite uh, diverse, very diverse. And on the, on the other hand, also what I mentioned, very harmonious. So we have a lot of people living here. We never had any any uh, uh, tension between the different uh, ethnic groups here. So uh, people living quite peaceful here. As a matter of fact, uh, this is the first time we, we have this live thing now, but the Secretary of Foreign Affairs of the United States, the first time in the history of Suriname, just landed, uh, I think, an hour ago to make a visit to Suriname on its way to Guyana and on its way to Brazil and, I think, Colombia. So never, ever in the history of Suriname did the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of the United States visit Suriname. So that means, uh, I think, uh, we might enjoy some good rum here also. And uh, he see the developments that are going on in the oil and gas industry offshore. Okay. 
Sure. Can I continue or you want to get some questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, when this company was uh, was founded, uh, it was primarily uh, the intention to to do products from the sugar estate mine work to, to to distribute them, to package them, and that we did for quite some time till the seventies. Uh, we had also a situation whereby there was a military coup in the nineteen eighties, nineteen eighty, and that was uh, for the economy not a good uh, period because uh, a lot of industries uh, went down and this company managed to survive because we did also uh, uh did some uh, some some other uh and other stuff like uh distributor for other companies etc just to, to keep alive and to keep continuing uh by uh the company uh 1982 was in the middle of the turmoil we uh brought out one of our best brands or flagship brand at Wogu. And, and in the same, at the end of that decade, we also started our uh, own fermentation and distillery plant, which was financed by Venezuela, Fondo uh, Inversión de Venezuela. There was also a little uh, uh, story behind that part because we already had some financing in place from Taiwan. Uh, my predecessor even went to Taiwan to sign contracts, but then there was some pressure from the China uh, Republic to say that you cannot do business with China, and you know this political stuff going on so we went to the region and we find uh, we found a financing partner in venezuela so where they were the one and the president of venezuela that came to suriname to 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 start to open the fermentation and distillation plant it was in 1999 it was a very dual system plan that was able to run on on rice grain and also on molasses so uh Unfortunately, um, as I explained, we had some 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 rocky years also uh, because uh, there were problems with the with the supply of molasses. We had some issues with uh, because this company is located on the Suriname River, and uh, the sugar estate mine work was on the other side of the river, so that we had some good supply. But then we had some problems, and then we started to import uh, uh, pre-fermented uh, molasses like uh, light uh, heavy room concentrate. And now we are in the brink of setting up an own new fermentation and distillation plant. Uh, it had some delay because of the whole COVID situation, uh, but you will see some pictures of the intended plan that we hope to have up and running, hopefully by next year. I don't know if Carla agrees with that, but uh, we are uh, we we should be running uh, that plant right now if we hadn't had any setbacks in the past two years. But everything is ready. We geared up everything. So when that uh, will be realized, the circle will be round again, and then we will have also our own uh, fermentation distillation again. And simultaneously, we will also try again. We also already have some, some spoken with some partners uh, to see if we can start the uh, sugar cane plant cultivation again in Suriname. Yes, Suriname has a lot of land uh, available. Uh, as you know, as you, as you don't know, Suriname is very scarcely uh let me say only on the, on the north side where the river is the capital paramaribo is and the rest is all forest 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 so there's only half a million people living in a very relatively big country that is not utilized for less than maybe 10 percent so uh, we are going to set it up and we want to do it in a very uh cooperative responsible way with the communities and uh, i saw something interesting a few years ago in uh the Dominican Republic, where Marcelo had something to do with the community and how they work with the development, with schools and happy people. And that is one of my dreams before, uh, which I would like to, to achieve because uh, we can do sugarcane again, but we want to do it in a very different way as it was done in the past. Mm. So that was indeed uh, something that uh, I hope that. Uh, by, by two years, we will, we will have this realized, the first part, this is the distillation and the fermentation plan. And hopefully within five years or five to seven years, we will also have the sugar cane for the supply of the, of the plant available. Yeah. So Stephen, a uh, quick question. So on, in 1999, uh, my understanding was that you were part of the Angostura sort of collection of companies uh, that they built over time. Yes. Um, what happened? There were three shareholders uh, in the beginning. Uh, one was uh, the Sugar Estate Mayberg, 
then you had the uh, the company Fernandez company that were the they were the licensed bottles of Coca Cola, and then you had the the family company Mayo. So what happened at one time? The government uh, during the the nineties, the government wanted to sell some of their, their stakes in, in companies, and our company was running quite well, profitable. So they found uh, they were able to to source and find. Uh, sell the shells and then we went out and we, we started talking with Angostura. So Angostura was the one that purchased the shares from the sugar estate mining mine. And they became their shareholders. So there was a strategic alliance with them and they supplied us with the raw material for at least 10 years. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that was, yeah. After, oh, go ahead. Yeah. After the 10 years, uh, then they uh, were in a different situation again. They, 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 they had to sell some of their, their investments worldwide. Uh, following the Clico uh, thing yeah. that went on, and then uh, we we were able to do something to buy the shares back, so the company is now 100% uh, Suriname owned again. Okay, yeah. So there are, people are curious about this sort of era. Uh, search for CL Financial. They were sort of the parent company that that purchased a number of companies, uh, including uh, you know parts of, of Suriname alcoholic beverages, uh, Appleton Estate. Uh, things True. like that so it's, it's a very interesting period of rum history recent rum history yeah. They, yeah. They, were, they weren't fully owners they started with 50 percent and right. uh, at one time they increased their their their, their share and then uh, when this thing happened and it fell apart then we were in a good position to buy back our shares and then have control of the company all over again but i think that uh, i may say that we had a very good relationship with them uh, certainly in the first years because they were our uh, sitting on our board, they were helping us in, in, in many ways, in production-wise, and uh, so basically uh, it was a very good uh, relationship. But after a while, things went uh, separately, and we started to do our own things again. Mm -hmm. Okay. The current situation right now. Right. Okay. Oh, you're looking at some uh, some old pictures. This was the sugar uh, cultivation at Marienburg, a very very large. Uh, you can compare this uh, by the 60s, 50s and 60s with the, the was not as large and big as, as, as Guyana, but it was quite considerable because we had a lot of uh, estates that were producing sugarcane. The rich history of sugarcane and cotton, but mainly sugarcane. So it is a big sad story that it all went down because uh, we were not able to keep it up as with other industries. So. Uh, for us, it will be a very good big achievement if you can realize this again on a small scale. This was also run by by uh, Dutch people, Dutch employees, uh, and also with uh, people imported from uh, the, the Far East, of Indonesia, and uh, India. There's a lot of people working in the industry yet. At times, you had, I think, more than Three to four thousand people working in that uh, in that the estate. Very very many manual. There's even the the prime minister at one point had a had a project running in Suriname whereby he said uh, it's not a shame to work in the sugarcane fields to cut the, the crowd, and uh, and then he tried to find people, even imported people from Haiti at one time. That's why you still have a large community of Haitians living in Suriname. Very very much very large very large community. So that is, uh, these are some pictures of the, the, the past, the golden past. It was the biggest employer in Suriname before the bauxite industry alumina took over as becoming the biggest one. And that was also overtaken by the oil company now, which is the biggest employer and uh, generator of more income for the state. So uh, when when uh, Marienburg Rum, this, this company was not uh, destined to be a producer itself. Uh, we were here more for the packaging, distribution part, export, etc. And, and at, when Marienburg uh, decided to cut back their production with half and at the end all completely, we had no other choice. And uh, with the help of the government to facilitate us, not financially, but in terms of uh, facilities to, to do the investments, we were able to set up this company and became our own producer. But at the, at the same token, the, the, the molasses supply was not more 
in place in locally. So we had to import molasses. We imported molasses from Guyana, from uh, it was before Guy Super Tate and Lyle. So uh, that was also uh, part of the history. And, just and then, uh, I was going to say for anybody who's not who's curious about that map there, the the very long boxes on there, those I believe those would would have been the very sugar estate. Yes, yes. Yeah. most of them coffee. Some of them are coffee and cacao, but uh, most citrus. Of, yeah, citrus, citrus also. Okay. But uh, before uh, you see that it was most of them were indeed in before this this came around the citrus and so on. There was sugar, 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 sugar right. estate. And right. it was diversified later on to make it more less dependent on only sugar cane. Right. But that, these are all districts where where you see Paramaribo is the capital, mm. and all these uh, these are estates. So we were talking with some of these estates to see if we can just start on a small scale the sugar cultivation again. And there's a lot of interest from it. We were at one stage very uh, far ahead to set up a plant in the in the in the western side. Uh, yes, this is very close to Guyana, um, but then uh, the, the company, the, the company that was supposed to do it, uh, just pulled back because they went to go into gold. So that is also very unfortunate. But it's also part of uh, for us a little right. set. Yeah. Yeah, I was, was going to say like the the estates and the layout and the river. It sort of reminds me of the the very old old maps of, of Demerara I've seen with the estates. They look very similar. And, yes, quite similar. Quite similar. Yeah, yeah, and and I believe had a had a common Dutch heritage. So, yes, very very strong. Uh, because uh, because of the fact that they stayed under the English uh, Commonwealth later, we went to Holland. So that's why we we but we have a similar geographical. I think we are a little bit more culturally diverse than them because we have so many different uh, people coming in that we're done. So. Uh, my understanding is that we are more culturally diverse than Guyana, but for the rest, there's a lot of similarities. Right. Even, the, even the name, the, we are doing now in terms of marketing internationally, uh, we are promoting Suriname because the name Suriname doesn't resonate with people. So I used to go back and say, this is just Guyana, formerly right. known. That was our old name before it was changed to Suriname because you have French Guyana, it's independence, uh, overseas dependence from France. And you have British Guiana, which is independent from the UK, and then you have Suriname, which became independent from Holland, the Netherlands. But um, there's a very strong, uh, strong link still with Dutch Guyana. Right. And is there is it like uh, Guyana today, where the the sugar plains or the sugar estates were sort of on a very coastal lowlands and not so much inland? True. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. Okay. That's the best, the best, uh, the best for the for the cultivation of the right. of the cane. And we had some very four years ago when the company that was involved with that part, that was the, the, the they were starting an ethanol plant, mm -hmm. uh, and we were partnering with them. We already signed everything. The design was made, and then uh, but it was a government-owned company for the ethanol, and they pulled out and they uh, decided to invest in gold. And so they went into gold and took a major share in gold, one of the bigger gold companies in the world. So basically, uh, that left us sitting with no uh, sugar estate anymore because they were quite far ahead in setting up a sugar estate, and the the, the revenues were very good, very good. Right. Okay. Okay. I think uh, I don't know my part. Yes. Which is I think quite. Uh, I have some more if you said the North questions and so on I yeah. about when uh, what we are doing but I'm, I'm available so right. yeah. okay so uh, Karen are you talking water supply yes yes so like mr. Mayam said uh, we had to import the molasses at, at one time but uh, we're very proud that Suriname is very good water uh, all of the water that we use here uh, is uh, supplied by the local uh, water company and what we do here is we collect the water, we filtrate it, we chlorinate it, and we also uh, do monthly microbiological analysis to make sure we, the, the quality of the water is good. What we also do, uh, the product, the water that we use in our product is uh, goes to a 
is goes through a reverse osmosis filter. So um, that is how we treat our water and uh, for usage. Um, like Mr. Mayim also said, uh, we do not ferment and distill at the moment. It, this is uh, temporarily. Uh, we have uh, we had fermented rice and grains, uh, but also molasses. Um, and uh, right now that part of the plan is done completely and our distillery shut down in 2017 um, the fermentation process was a batch fermentation process and uh, uh, forgot to say that the rice that we used was uh, supplied by local farmers Okay. Yeah, and I was just going to say that these these are all all separate. They're not doing rice and molasses together. No, not no no yeah. no yeah. not not at the same time. Because yes. when we were doing the slide deck, it made me think of uh, Indonesia and Batavia rock, but uh, with both, it's not what you're doing here. So. No, no. Yeah. Okay, and our uh, we're working on a project to start a new fermentation and uh, upgrade our distillation plan. Like Mr. Maya said, um, the plan is to start it in two, within two years and it will be uh, 6,500 liters a day uh, alcohol per day uh, production facility. Karen, are those, are those uh, tanks on the left, are those molasses storage tanks or alcohol the fermentation. Tanks? The fermentation. Okay, okay, the fermentation tanks. Okay, excellent. So it's going to be all um, stainless steel. Okay. The fermentation plan and in the distillation plan, we will use some of the columns that we have, which are still in good shape. Right. Um, right, right. But they are going to be uh, uh, kind of upgraded. Okay. Later. Yeah. You know, are the their fermentation tanks? Are they uh, are they pipes so that you can pull off the CO two? Uh, for this moment, not. But in in the future, we will collect the CO two and probably can so we can probably sell it to the local uh, CO two the companies that bottle like beer or soft drinks. Right. Okay. Yes. Right. But that that's optional. Okay. Yes. So we had a we still have a three column uh, column still. Uh, consisting of a bare column, a purifier column, and a rectifier column. Uh, we mainly use light, produce light drums, we used to produce light drums, and we still use light drums now. And we also have a pot still. Still. So the, uh, back, back for a second. I have a question on the, on the column still. So, yes. as I understand it, you use the beer column and the and the rectifier column so when making rum you don't always use the purifier column yes uh at, but at the end we did use all the columns uh because we did need them to uh we did have some slight problems with the second column i think okay. but uh, okay. at the end we did use all the three columns to make sure that uh, we got a good uh, product in the end okay so that's so when you, your your rum actually goes through all three columns Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And uh, yes. So we also have a pot still, a small pot still. It's a John Doerr uh, pot still. It's made of copper. It's uh, a 500 liter liter pot still. It's double retort, and we use the the pot still rums. Uh, we we age them. Rika will tell us maybe something about it some more. But uh, when we pot still uh, the alcohol, we used it to age it. Okay. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me. Looking at the picture, it sort of reminds me of the the double retort at um, at the Saint Lucia Distillers. Very similar looking. Okay, but I bet they have a larger one. <laughs> this no, is a small it's, one. It's not terribly much larger, if I remember correctly. I don't know if Ian is in the in, the, in this uh, meeting, but. Uh, Maybe Ian can confirm. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, no, it's it, still it, it, Yeah, they have two double retorts, but the small one looks kind of like that one. So. Okay, okay. Yeah. Later on in this presentation, I will tell something about what we did with it this year. Okay, so Rika, you're on. Yes. Uh, 
this part is about the aging. Okay, we use for the for aging one cellular white oak barrels. The barrels are also charred barrels, and we have also three thousand barrels, and they start in three locations. They start on talus and wrecks, and the filling strength is about eighty five percent. And the interest rate is 6% per year. And we also have a better monitoring system in place. And is there, do you have some, like an on site cooperage or, or do barrel repair? Yes, we do barrel uh, repair. Um, that's when there are leakage, we do some assembling the uh, barrel. Okay. And so yeah, that, I was noticing the eighty-five percent alcohol uh, where you go into the cast. That's relatively high compared to some of the other yeah. stores I've seen. Um, I know, but for us, it's the best way to uh, strength at that way, and okay. we get our smooth rum. Okay. Are you are you moving away towards racks going forward, or 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 do you have a particular reason for using both both of them? Oh, both of them. They also uh, we also use uh, racks or pelletize. Right. Yeah. So I was saying a lot of distilleries that I've seen are sort of like they have racks, but they're sort of have moved as as they expand or add more barrels, they they go towards pallets rather than building more racks. Oh, okay. But but we use both of them. Okay. Yes, and we'll we'll be using uh, both because it is what is convenient to us right now. So yeah. we'll continue to use both at this okay. time. Okay. 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 Next slide. Okay. Okay. So uh, we also have a lab, of course, uh, like all the distilleries. Uh, we do uh, some quality control tests, like incoming raw material. We do our water and rinse checks, product checks from all the products that we mix and blend, and also the finished products. We do sensory analysis. We have a, a tasting panel that uh, tests all our batches every day. Um, and, is that, uh, is that a tasting panel where you draw from your various employees? Yes, we have various, but they, 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 they first did a training and then once you're trained, you can, uh, you join the panel and then every day you get an email saying that you have to come and taste the batches. So uh, I'm on the team. I sometimes have to taste four times a day. But, okay. uh, it's not drinking, it's tasting. So <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah, so we also do some customer feedback analysis. Sometimes you have some complaints or people just want to know if the product is still good. So we have that tested in our lab. We are doing a new project while upgrading the lab. We're going to build a new modern lab, uh, including a research and development facility. Uh, this is also necessary because when we start distilling, we need to we need some more upgraded, a more upgraded lab. Okay. On the right hand side, uh, you can see some of the equipment that we have. This is not everything, but those this uh, this is a uh, on the top picture photo. You can see uh, GC. And on the bottom, that is our newest uh, equipment that we bought this year, and that is an Anton Par alkalizer, which measures mes measures pH, alcohol percentage, right. and uh, right. and uh, gravity. Okay. Do you do you have a, a mass spectrometer as well, or just just GC? Yes, we have a small one, but that's uh, yeah, that's an old one. <laughs> Okay. These okay. are the newer uh, okay. equipment. Yes. Okay. Next slide. Okay. So Rick is going to expand some more on our products. Next slide. Yes. Yes. This is the reserve line. The reserve line consists of uh, older rums. If you see, you see the 15 year old, the 12 year old, and the eight year old, the, all these rums are rich in flavor. So the eight year old is, has a, a smooth, silky smooth, sweet and rich, and it has an oaky flavor. 
Also for the 12 year old, it is so it's also rich in flavor. And the 15 year is extra smooth and also has a oaky, oaky finish. So what, so what what is the strength that these are bottled at? Uh, 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 all of the uh, old uh, forty percent. Okay, okay. And do you chill filter these or or not? No, we don't okay. chill filter. We have a special filter, okay. a no chill filter. Okay. And, and next, this is the gold line. The gold line consists of the bulk gold. The bulk gold has a uh, sweet taste and a smooth finish. The Bolgo Extra, that's also, uh, it's warm and it's uh, smooth, kind of oaky. And the Bolgo Five Year, that has um, a silky smooth, sweet taste and a caramel flavor. Okay. So are these, it's a question, are these blended from a series of sort of different marks from the still, or are these all just basically using oh. marks? And, and put it in a cask and, and age it. No, no, no actual blending of different styles of rum. Hello. These are all columns there, and it has a uh, minimum. Is okay. Yeah, you, you cut out for a second, so I didn't quite hear that. So, so yes, yes, they are a blend or are of different marks, or no, they're not. They're they're all a single mark. They are they're blended two years. Okay. Two years old. Okay. Yes. So you have also we have also other products like the Marin Durakon, the highest strength in ninety percent. And you have also the Marin Bura sixty five percent that has a sugar cane flavor. And you also have the sugar cane balls vodka. Uh, it's neutral and it's extra smooth. We also have the, the Hanapi. That's uh, we bottle this on the license from Cafe. And there you have the Daru Dark. This is the darkest rum. It has a fruity, fruity character. And then you have the Black Cat rum. It has a sweet taste and a vanilla character. Yeah, and just and just for for people who might have missed it, there is I think it's the one on the left that is ninety. I don't know what's up. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that that is amongst one of the strongest commercial rums in the world. Yes, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, um, Karen, did you say there was a story about about that people drinking that? Yes, <laughs> they actually take a shot. They they buy a shot in the the small uh, stores. And next to it, they buy a cup of cold water. So first they shut the Marimbur 90% rum. And then afterwards, they cool off their throat with a, a glass of cold water. Yes. I don't know how they do it, but it's very strong. But it sounds... So it's not, not a shipping rum. No. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, but actually... If I may add, uh, it is a rum that is a very uh, cultural uh, one of the, I would say, is like uh, in Suriname, it is like an institute. Uh, even in Holland, we, we do some, ex we did some large exports of this rum. It was even sold in one of the leading chains, Kalingal, in, in, Holland, in the Netherlands, where people were buying it. So uh, there's a lot of research done on this brand whereby people are saying, why, who's drinking it? Who are the drinkers? What, what, what do you use it for? So it's a very, uh, it's very holy. It has been there when I was very young and I heard about it, I said, no, it is, and it's still around. So uh, it has changed throughout the years, but still it is, uh, I call it an institute. It's a very mysterious and a very intriguing brand at the same time. Okay. Uh, next slide, Will. There we go. Yes, just adding to our products. So we, we bottle products for the local market, but also for the export market. We export to the U.S., to the Netherlands, and uh, to Dominica. 
Yes. Okay, so uh, this year uh, we have, uh, we had in March, uh, we were all uh, surprised by COVID-19 and um, our, the, our, our, the request for sanitizing alcohol or an alcohol sanitizing solution, uh, the demand went up. So uh, we started producing that also, and uh, as part of our co corporate social responsibility uh, plan, we donated uh, the 70% alcohol sanitizing solution. Uh, our first donation was to the Ministry of Public and Health. There you see Mr. Mayang handing over a, a bottle of 70% uh, alcohol sanitizing solution to the Minister of Public Health back then. Uh, I think this was in March, right, Mr. Mayung, or in April, that we did the handing over. Mm -hmm. uh, we also donating to testing the COVID-19 testing centers, to healthcare centers, and to elderly homes. We also, next slide, please. We also uh, did a project, a uh, joint project with a local bear brewery that's called the Surinamsi Bear Brewery. They are part of Heineken. Uh, we produce together and we develop a 70% alcohol sanitizer. And what we did is um, the brewery donated their beer. Um, they had some extra or injected beer, uh, which had an alcohol percentage of 5%. And we pot still did. We, in our pot still, we um, reduced the alcohol percentage to about 50% and then blended it with our own alcohol to produce 70% alcohol solution. So for a, brief, was, yeah, for a brief moment, you had whiskey. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> yes, exactly. <Yeah>. But <laughs> it smelled really good. I can tell you that, right, Rico? <laughs> yes, that's, yes, that's right. Yes, it was a very nice project to do, and it was also nice to start up our pot still again. It still works, and um, so that was a good thing to do. And that uh, that product that we made together with the Bear Brewery, we donated to four local hospitals and health centers. Okay, next slide. Yes, and here you can see the handing over of some of the alcohol sanitizing solution to the, the one of the hospitals. And the handing over was done with our people together with the, pe the people from the Surinamese, the Suriname Sabir Brawade. Yes. Okay. Um, and we're also, SAB is also part of Stifasur. Stifasur is a, um, is the Foundation for Responsible Alcohol Consumption in Suriname. The, together with two other companies, the Suriname Beer Brauere, that's the Surinamese Beer Company, and, and, and King's, King's is an alcohol distributor. Together we make, we have 80% of the market share, and we are joined together in Stifasur to make sure um, the, the responsible alcohol consumption in Suriname is being promoted. Yes. Okay, and this is their logo, and we're proud to be part of the team uh, of the foundation uh, because we do think we do have a responsibility uh, because we, have, we are an alcohol producing company. So it is our responsibility to um, to create awareness in the Surinamese, um, to, among the Surinamese people, yes. I don't know if Mr. Maya wants to add something to this part. About the co corporate rules of responsibility? No, I think yes. uh, everything uh, has been said. Uh, I think that during the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we, and we took our part of what we had to do as an alcohol uh, company. So the demand was huge. Uh, we run on our uh, low, low, low stocks because there was so much demand for the Marienburg brand that we just spoke about and also 
on the uh, alcohol for sanitizers. I we just mentioned briefly the the whiskey part, and uh, the, the the guys from Heineken were like, "Hey, we can do a nice whiskey in the future, maybe so together." Because it was a project that was for both companies, two leading companies in the local business. It was a very very good project, uh, and it was very very fun to work together. And all people were proud to be part of that part team, and so it had a lot of good exposure from the community, so that uh, beer and rum coming together and do something for fighting against COVID. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, is that the last slide? Great. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so we have some, some good questions here uh, before we jump into them. Um, really quick, uh, I think, Stephen, do you want to tell us more about where we can get Borgu rums, like in the United States and in Europe? Okay. Um, let me start with Europe, it's easy because we have been doing export to Holland. Um, we have also done some small export to Germany. Um, basically, um, there is a lot of uh, inquiries coming from these countries, even Scandinavian countries, um, UK, etc. cetera. Um, Germany, I was in Germany two weeks ago and spoke to some, 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 some interested people who want to buy. But uh, mainly now is in, in, in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, then we talk about the U.S. Uh, we started with one of our uh, brands, it's a Black Hat Rum, the white rum. So we did a quite considerable amount of uh, containers last year. Uh, basically, we started in uh, New Jersey, New, uh, New York, and there were some other states uh, opening also, Florida. Uh, as I mentioned before, the demand was huge. Uh, because of the different sizes, bottle sizes that we couldn't adequately handle at the time. Right. So basically, uh, they were pushing behind us and say, hey, you have to deliver. And uh, we did everything to to, to, the, to to supply the market. It's a huge market. Um, but uh, there's a lot of interest coming in from several states in the US, Canada as well. Uh, but we have not been able to uh, as yet, uh, because our focus has been to, 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 to focus on a few markets uh, which we have done and then instead of going to 10, 15, 20 markets, which eventually hope that we will be able to do that well because that is the purpose of everything that we do. But uh, for now, uh, we have an importer and distributor in uh, in West Palm Beach, Florida, who is doing uh, everything for us in all the states. At the same time, I'm speaking now with an uh, importer who does also a nice job with uh, some rums from the Caribbean. He's in New York based and we send some samples, so he's interested in bringing the board because we get people coming in uh, not so long ago, I got a uh, mail from people who were sitting in the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco and saying, I'm drinking from your rum. I know why it's called the Golden Rum now, and it's a very nice letter that you got from people that you've never seen before, you don't know them, but it gives you a lot of courage to say you are on a good track and you have to continue to do what you're doing. But as a small company, uh, I think Suriname, as a country was focused very much internally to solve the problem that we had economically and also politically. So we are getting out of this now. We had elections in uh, in May. We're getting out now and opening up to the world again to see that we can expand our business beyond our borders. But I would say that in the 80s, everything was more geared towards surviving, staying alive as a company, and trying to get our, our inputs coming in, which was a very, very big challenge. But at the same time, we also uh, we are now ready because we didn't compete in a lot of uh, international spirit competitions. We did compete in 70 years and then we started again and we won some nice prizes also, which gives you also a lot of uh, leverage. So uh, I think we are now ready with all these developments going on, these exciting developments going on that we are also able to add with our rum to the world so right. uh, but we have we have some 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 uh, some ground to catch up with the other uh, right. the other uh, producers but we will get there yeah no I, I look i look forward to the day where we can buy the reserve line here in the united states yeah you can uh, reserve not yet uh, they they, I, they were planned to start in this year the mid of this year but then the all the exports came to a standstill because of all right. these COVID. Yeah. But uh, we are now uh, rescheduling and seeing that we want to add also the, the bottle to that. And we will let you know exactly uh, when you can find it and uh, right. thank you, Bado. <laughs> no, 
No, I, I know there's a lot of uh, American rum enthusiasts who were who would jump on it if they could get it. So, yeah. Okay, so some questions here. Uh, first one is from Dave Russell. It says, uh, it says about a decade ago, there were reports that Suriname alcoholic beverages occasionally sourced some rums from Caroni. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, I had I got this question from a guy, a friend of me who was in rum. Uh, no, we never did that because uh, we know that Caroni was a state com a state owned company during that. Uh, I know that when we were part of the Angostura group, uh, uh, working with them together, that they were also doing. But we had never any contact and we never bought any rum from them. I would like to buy rum from them because I hear the rum was excellent. But we were never in the position. There was an auction, I think, uh, because one of my board members from Angostura was, went to went to the auction. But we were never in a position ever to be able to buy the stock from Coroni. But if I had the chance, I would buy it. Oh, yeah, no, for the, sure. The answer is no. Never. Right. And I think, I think there's a lot of confusion around that because some people think Angostura actually bought Coroni. And, you know, there's debate yeah. whether they did or not. But uh, I've, you know, industry people have told me who, who are there, so being like Angostura did not actually buy Coroni. Um, but they did buy some of the stock. So it, it's sort of a natural point of confusion to sort of uh, put Angostura and Caroni in that same and sort of bucket, if you will. So um, next question, also from Dave, it says that your second slide mentions importing rum concentrate. Can you tell us about this? Yes, uh, because we had some problems with the, with the molasses. We were importing molasses from, from, from Tate and Lyle through Gaisuko. But then um, we had problems to bring the molasses into the company. Then uh, people advised us to hey, have a look at Grenada. They have some 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 system in place whereby they go with trucks, uh, small trucks. They run run uh, drive around the block and to to, to unload. We had a vessel here uh, with a barge with 900 tons of molasses. We couldn't offload it. It was a big big disaster. Uh, we didn't get a license to have the ship there uh, in the in the river going with flexible holes so then we we when we started with angustura they uh, offered us to say okay we can give you a product that is already distilled for one column so what we did we imported that spirit because of the viscosity uh, and then we run it through our own distillation here uh, that is what we did for for at least 10 years uh, to do that process but we had no uh, there was not a possibility to bring the molasses anywhere. We had, we had to to, to to look for alternatives to bring the molasses in our production process, and uh, it's something that we have to deal with. We already spoken with some operators of the of the of the of the port to set up a by dinner to set up a uh, bulk terminal to to load the molasses there and then transport it in trucks uh, to Suriname. It's something that we also are still again looking at it at right now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next question. Uh, they, they've got lots of them in there. It says, the excellent and delicious 15-year-old Borgu rum that was produced five to 10 years ago had a very different uh, organoleptic flavor profile than your eight and five-year rums. Uh, the difference seemed more than aging than just aging. Can you, can you tell us about those? No, what we did, um, what we, we, we hired people uh, together with our team to come and uh, work together with master blenders. As I mentioned, there was a master blender from Canada. Uh, we had some people, uh, retired people from the Caribbean came on to help us. So we had some old aged uh, rum in the, in the barrels. Uh, Rika mentioned something about, you asked her question about the chill filtering. And this one project we did in the beginning, because when we developed this brand, uh, it was uh, used to, to go to chill filter we did it at the other company we did it a few times but then uh we we we, we stopped that and uh, but the the 50 year old rum is uh made from the same rum from the barrels that we have available in our barrel warehousing so basically uh, it is uh, not something it's a different proce procedure etc to go through it it is like the, the 12 years old rum but i heard this before they say it is uh, it has a different uh, texture, etc. But it's the same rum that we get from there. It was a, I think Rico, correct me if I'm wrong, that it was also a blend with a little pot still. 
Yes, 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 that's true. Yes. yes. Okay, so, oh, which okay. Yeah. so there was so, some of your pots from was still around aging and cask, and so that would have been two different marks, like some of your columns still rum and some of the pots still rum. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Vaughn asked, um, is the water supply in Suriname originally from wells or from the rivers? From wells. wells. We have, we have actually, I didn't know if we, I didn't know if Karen mentioned it because the water, it's one of the things that we also promote. Water is, in Suriname is so very good water that we have, one of the best waters, I think, that we we don't use river water, we use only wells. And the water is very good. Even the people from Coca Cola would uh, came to Suriname and they say, from me, your water is so excellent uh, compared to the other countries and islands. So we, have, we are very fortunate. To make uh, to have the availability of the best water that we can have around, so the water is definitely from wells. Okay. Uh, another question from Vaughn, which is uh, echoes one of my questions earlier. It says many companies are moving to palletized systems for aging. What are the advantages for you in maintaining a rack system? Okay. Well, good question because it's very actual within our company right now. Uh, we are looking, and I've been to a lot of uh, distilleries, uh, warehousing from distilleries and from wines, etc., all over the world. And I think that the way we are, we have been doing it, is not the way uh, I would like to see it. Just internal discussion that we also have because we lose a lot of space. Uh, I've seen uh, at uh, the Dominican Republic, I've seen how they stock and they pile up the the barrels. Uh, we are now in the process of uh, doing a great uh, rejuvenation of our uh, warehousing and the barrel warehousing will also uh, be part of that process also we are setting up a new barrel warehousing on the other side of the street where we have a very large building and we are looking and talking now with experts to see how we can do the best way to best way forward to do the the, the stocking and pile of the, the barrels but i think that eventually we will also do go over from the, the system that we currently have now. It's, it's, it's not efficient. We, I, I, to, in my opinion, we lose a lot of space. If you look at the picture from where we stand with what we do now. And, uh, but it was something that was, the decision was made long ago to do it like that, on the wooden uh, uh, racks. Wooden racks. Right. But, uh, yes. yeah. It's easy because they say, yeah, you can go with a, with a, with a pellet truck there, you can take the barrels out. But I've seen in the, all the studies would have been is that they just style them up and it's that's the most efficient way but we we are going to find a solution for that i think within to 2020 2021 hopefully okay uh next question and i think you answered this on the slides it says uh, could you share what your angel share is and i think you said it was around six percent we did yes okay uh and then vaughn asked another question uh, what type of rum is most popular for drinking in Suriname, and how do the Surinamese drink rum? Besides, besides the shots. <laughs> Borgu rum is the most popular rum. Before that, uh, let me say in 1977, uh, Black Cat rum, the one that is exported to the U.S. currently, was the number one brand of Suriname. We did considerably amounts of Black Cat rum. Uh, it was the popular rum, the most popular rum. At one point when we had issues with Marienburg rum, this is interesting also maybe to, to tell the audience is that we had uh, problems with supply from Marienburg rum, so we had to import rum, even from Europe. And it was something uh, the government, the, the, the prime minister wanted uh, the management by then to say, you cannot stop with black hat rum, and then we import rum. It was maybe not uh, the way that we wanted to have the rum, not aged by us as we wanted to do, but we couldn't stop the production and the sell, selling of our black hat rum. So in the late 80s, there came a shift and Borgo rum, dark rum, became the most popular rum. And then uh, after 2000, the millennium, we started with uh, the extra and the five and we get uh, to the older ages. We have now rums in case for 25 years. Uh, but um, I think that uh, Borgo rum is the most uh, feasible uh, brand we call it our icon brand because of all the very different varieties right. and there's even in in, in in europe so very very popular and uh people asking for where, where can we find Borgo rum 
So it's kind of frustrating on the one hand that you cannot be able to say you can go to this next door next door shop and you can buy the the burger room. Right. But burger room, absolutely. The popular room. So is it primarily people drinking it it uh, neat by itself, or like in in simple cocktails, or how, how what, what's the typical yeah. consumption of it? The, main, the mainstream is with Coke mostly. Uh, people drink it with juice sometimes also, or, or with Sprite, but mostly Coke. And the reserve is more sip neat, like a cognac. The okay. people don't people don't make that. It's okay. just like a very neat. And is the the reserve line is that is it mostly exported or is there a, a good marketing locally? It's not exported that much. Uh, in Europe, you can find it in Europe, in Holland mainly. Uh, but uh, this is more for the domestic market. Okay. For now, it has not been there for too long. Um, but it is uh, the intention as well to bring it out, and you have indeed some some small exports also to, to some uh, regional countries in the past. All right. And next question. Vaughn uh, asks, do you ever plan to reduce your bar barrel filling strength? <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing some tests on that to see um, how that it, it, it will impact the, the flavor of our products. So this last year, this year we started the, the test. So uh, we'll, we'll see once the results are in. Um, and once the master blender is is happy with the with the taste of our products, so but at the moment it's in the testing phase. Right. Okay. Yes. Uh, and then another question. This one from Eric K, who's a an American, <laughs> is now has his own independently bottled rum lines. Uh, he asked, "Do you have any plans to re-release the Jubilee Reserve?" Interesting question from uh, from Eric, who I personally know also. I think that um, we are going to bring the Jubilee rum because it is a standalone rum right now in a wooden casket, a uh, wooden uh, canister. Uh, people like it to give it away as a relationship uh, gift, but I think uh, we are now planning to bring the bo uh, the Jubilee rum under the Borgu umbrella. So within the company, within marketing, we are uh, trying to. Uh, working towards bringing it there because it's just now standalone. It doesn't have the the, the, the power of a brand, big brand behind it like Borgu is. So uh, the, the idea was to bring it onto the Borgu line as a special Jubilee brand. Okay, uh, so that's it for questions. Uh, anything you would like to say before we start to sign off? <laughs> Yes, I want to thank for this moment that I can share this to the world. And I'm very thankful. All right. Well, thank you all of you for this. This has been uh, amazing, and we've got some great information here. Uh, so you can watch. So we've had people watching it live, but we'll also be able to see it uh, live or recorded as well on the Zappy website. It will be up there for. Uh, forever, hopefully, and but also for some people up here also. We are reposting them on the Authentic Caribbean Rum YouTube channel as well, so you can either catch it on Zavi or on the uh, the Authentic Caribbean Rum channel. We have a dedicated sub channel just to just to watch these series of videos, so you'll be able to catch this, Demerara Stillers, and Mount Gay, and. Appleton and all those rums where as we do these we're putting them up on our YouTube channel so uh, you can always watch them some at some point so uh, thank you again very much uh, Will do you want to take us out? Yes uh, sure thank you just to echo what Matt said uh, thanks to all three of you for taking the time to, to join us today it's it's so great I think you know many of our listeners um, the audience in the states I think is less familiar with rums from Suriname so getting the opportunity to learn about it, uh, especially all the history you went through, Stephen, was really fascinating. Um, and by the way, Dave Russell chimed in with one more comment saying, please, please bring the reserve rums to the USA. So um, already have some people eagerly awaiting the arrival of those. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 Matt will second it and I will third it. Um, but yeah, thank you so much to all three of you. And uh, Matt, I, I, I believe we'll be back in two weeks with uh, another. Yeah, we have guest. Another one. not not ready to reveal just yet, but uh, it's going to be another another country where where most people aren't don't know a whole lot about it, but uh, definitely worth <laughs> remember. So. Excellent. Can't wait to, to find out what that is and, and be back to, uh, to learn even more. So thanks everyone for, for coming and uh, we'll see you in another two weeks. All right, take care. Thank you very much. It was a real Bye -bye. pleasure and thank you. thank you again for the opportunity and also to Fawn and his team for giving us this, uh, this forum to expose ourselves to the bigger world. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Yes. Okay, bye-bye.